Hi, this is Dr. Karen Becker, and today we're going to talk about yeasty dogs. Now, as with people, dogs have a normal amount of healthy levels of yeast that naturally occur on their body. The balance of the normal healthy flora of dogs, flora can be their natural occurring staph, which they have, as well as um, a light layer of naturally occurring yeast. That balance of healthy flora is kept in check by a healthy and balanced immune system. On the immune spectrum, balance is in the middle, and that's where we want our dogs to be. An underactive immune system can absolutely lead to yeast overgrowth because the immune system isn't healthy enough to maintain opportunistic yeast blooms. An overactive immune system, over here where allergies are, can also lead to yeast problems. What happens almost always in a traditional veterinary community is when dogs have allergies or an overactive immune system, either number one, veterinarians prescribe steroids, which turn the immune system off, and when the immune system's turned off through drugs, then the body can't respond to uh, the body's ability to want to regulate and balance normal flora levels, so you end up with yeast blooms. So steroids can cause secondary opportunistic yeast, and certainly antibiotics that are then prescribed because of opportunistic infections. Antibiotics are well known to obliterate all the good bacteria and healthy yeast levels, so you end up with this opportunistic yeast bloom. The second reason that dogs that have allergies end up with a lot of yeast is that they can actually develop an allergy to their yeast. So intradermal testing that uh, dermatologists will do will sometimes reveal that dogs are having allergic responses to their own natural flora. And that can be a real problem because they have uh, it, this allergic response that occurs to their yeast literally from head to toe. You will see them red from the tip of their nose to the tip of the tail. Their whole body's flaming red and irritated. And that can actually be a yeast allergy that their body's mounting against their own normal flora. So allergic responses, dogs will commonly end up with yeast, and an underactive immune system or immunosuppressed, immunosuppressed pets also can end up with yeast. Now, your veterinarian can determine that your pet has yeast by either cytology, which is looking at a, a skin swab underneath the microscope, or by culture, but you'll be able to know that your pet has yeast just by how they smell. Yeast has a very characteristic smell. Some people will describe it as a moldy bread smell. Some people will say their dogs smell musty. I think it smells like Frito corn chip. In fact, if some people call them Frito feet, kind of a pungent cheese popcorn, musty, stinky smell. Dogs should not, some people say, oh, dogs have doggy odor. Dogs shouldn't have doggy odor if they're healthy dogs. So if you have a dog that has stinky paws or stinky ears that are musty, chances are your dog's probably dealing with yeast. Now, Yeast are tremendously itchy, so that's your other clue. If your dog will not leave his or her feet alone, or they're constantly scratching ears, or they're constantly pushing their butt on the ground because their butt itches, those are all indications that your dogs could be dealing with a yeast overgrowth problem. Yeast are really itchy, and if given the chance, dogs will spend hours digging at themselves because of this intense itch. So uh, evaluating where your dog is itchy and what's growing there, whether it's bacteria or yeast, can be a really important par part of solving the overwhelming itch. If your dog is dealing with yeast, a couple things you've got to think about. Number one, to help control yeast, you have to address diet. Now, occasionally, and actually rarely, if your dog just has yeast in one spot, let's say one ear is yeasty and the rest of the dog is fine, you can probably get by just treating the ear for yeast and hoping that the immune system recognizes what's going on and the body takes care of the problem. However, if you have a dog that has yeast a little bit everywhere, like all four paws are yeasty, both ears are yeasty or their whole body's yeasty, you have no choice but to address diet. In fact, diet being the foundation of health, we know that how you nourish your pet is either going to help with the yeast response in terms of balancing the immune system or be feeding a yeast problem. So we're going to encourage you to put your dogs on what I call an anti-yeast diet. Now here's what's interesting. Anti-yeast diet is also an anti-inflammatory diet, which is also a species appropriate diet. And what we mean by that is we know that yeast needs sugar for a source of energy. And we know that carbohydrates break down into sugar. So one of the things that you'll hear veterinarians as well as human doctors say with people or pets that are dealing with yeast blooms is you've got to get the sugars out of your pet's diet. That's absolutely true in veterinary medicine as well. But sugar isn't just white 
sugar, which of course can be hidden in, in many, many treats and some pet foods. Those secret hidden words of sugar uh, can also cause yeast problems like honey, although honey of course can be beneficial for pets. It can, it's providing a food source for yeast. So pets that are dealing with yeast, when you review treat and food bags, there should be no honey, no high fructose corn syrup, no uh, even white potato or sweet potatoes. If you have a pet that's dealing with a really significant yeast problem, we recommend that you go completely sugar-free, which means you feed low glycemic veggies and you eliminate potatoes, corn, wheat, rice. All of the carbohydrates need to go uh, when it comes to providing a low sugar diet for your pet. So that's a really important step and I wish I could tell you you'll be able to not only treat yeast but you'll be able to effectively keep them at bay without addressing diet. You probably won't so you need to make sure that your first step is to put your pet on a diet that is conducive to balancing healthy normal flora levels. Second thing that we're going to recommend you do is consider adding some naturally antifungal foods. So a small amount of garlic added to your pet's diet as well as oregano. Both of those foods are naturally antifungal or anti-yeast and they can be beneficial at helping to reduce the amount of yeast levels that you in your pet's body. Third thing we're going to recommend that you do is disinfect the yeasty parts. Now this is a really overlooked common sense, almost free, pretty darn cheap approach. If you think about human medicine, people who have recurrent yeast infections, there's no way that you're going to be able to not disinfect parts that are yeasty and be okay. In fact, dermatologists and internists will give you specific treatment protocols to be able to address yeasty parts of the body. We don't do that in veterinary medicine and it's kind of a shame. What we say is here's some cream, here's a cream or salve or dip and just keep putting the cream on the area. The problem is, is that as yeast die, it's just layer of dead yeast on top of layer and unless you remove and disinfect the skin, that dead yeast um, with a bunch of ointment actually can exacerbate the situation. So disinfecting the parts of your pet's body that are yeasty is really important and there is no replacement for disinfecting. There are two things that don't come in pill form, D baths or disinfecting and exercise. There's, those are two things you just have to do for your pet. So if your pet's ears are yeasty, you have to disinfect their ears daily. Just as some people have to get out of the shower and Q-tip out their ears every day, some people never have to Q-tip out their ears. Some dogs never have to have their ears cleaned and many dogs have to have their ears cleaned every day. The frequency of which you clean your dog's ears is 100% dependent on how much debris your dogs produce. So if you have a Labrador that has soupy ears every single day, May, June, July, and August, you need to be cleaning every single day, May, June, July, and August. If you look in your dog's ears and they're clean and dry and beautiful, you get to skip a day of cleaning. But the amount of cleaning has to correlate to the amount of debris. If you have a dog that has a ton of debris in their ears and you leave it in there, I wish I could say it's gonna magically disappear on Wednesday, it will brew, it will go from wax to yeast to a fulminant bacterial infection unless you remove that debris. So your dogs are counting on you to help remove some of that debris to help reduce the likelihood of yeast overgrowth or secondary infection. If you have yeasty paws in your home, dogs, uh, yeast love a damp, wet, moist environment. They like, they like crevices, so around the vulva, around the anus, between the pads, in the armpits, in the groin creases. That's where yeast can thrive uh, unregulated, so disinfecting those parts are really important. Dogs that have really yeasty feet, they need to have their feet disinfected. Keep in mind the only place dogs sweat from is their nose and their pads. So during hot, humid months when yeast tend to really be thriving, you need to do something to disinfect your dog's paws. Now, my recommendation is if you have a big dog, get a Rubbermaid sweater tub and fill it up with a hose. Um, I like a concentration, a, a water concentration that you can just parade your dogs through. If you have a small dog, you can actually just plunk them in your kitchen sink. If you have a really big dog that you can do neither, you can get a coffee can or um, a, a cup. But dunking the foot in a foot soak is a much more therapeutic option than spraying or even wiping down your pet's feet. Wiping down your pet's feet to try and remove yeast is nearly impossible because yeast live under the nail beds and in all the creases that you're not going to get to. So actually soak the dog's foot and then patting dry is really important. At my practice I recommend a gallon of water, a cup of peroxide and a cup of white vinegar as a foot dunk solution and you can do that one to 30 times a day, that's an exaggeration, but you can do it as, as often as necessary to keep your dog's feet clean and dry. That really needs to be your mantra. Now after you, um, after you dip your pet's feet in this astringing solution, 
you can pat dry um, and and you don't have to rinse it off. That solution left on your pet's feet is antifungal and will help reduce the amount of licking and then secondary yeast production that will occur. You can clean your dog's ear out either with a solution you prefer to buy, you can use witch hazel on big cotton balls, but you've got to remove debris using as many cotton balls as it takes to be able to effectively keep your dog's ears clean and dry. Third thing, besides disinfecting regular, you're going to disinfect ears wherever they're yeasty, disinfect feet, or disinfect wherever they're itching. It could be armpits that you're going to hit up every single day with a, ant, a naturally anti-yeast solution. The other thing you need to think about is anti-yeast baths. Now keep in mind, this: there's a myth, um, and actually it's really not a myth, that you should never bathe your pet. This actually was founded in the early 1930s when the only shampoos we had available for pets were coal tar derivatives. Back in the 30s and 40s when all we had was sulfur and coal tar or lye-based shampoos really damaging to your pet's hair. So the, the end result was never bathe your pet. We know now just as you can shampoo your hair every day if you desire or every other day or several times a week and that have a drying effect. If you pick your pet shampoos wisely, you have nothing to worry about when it comes to over drying. If your pets have yeast growing on their skin, you have no choice but to use oral drugs, which I do not recommend to treat yeast, or the common sense thing, which is disinfect your pet's body with a naturally antifungal shampoo. Now, I just mentioned that yeast love grains and carbs, so do not use oatmeal on a yeasty dog because oatmeal is a grain and that provides a food source. I want you to use an antifungal shampoo such as tea tree oil um, or an herbal shampoo that will help naturally diminish the amount of yeast growing on your pet. I also do a lot of naturally antifungal rinses during the summer months. That's a gallon of water plus a cup of vinegar, which makes the dog smell nice, um, or a cup of uh, lemon juice, which makes them smell even nicer. Uh, Add it to a gallon of water. You can also use 20 drops of peppermint oil. Now, all of these post bath rinses. You do not pour on the head. Don't get any rinse in your dog's eyes. We pour from the collar back. But during the summer months when you're bathing your dogs that have yeast a little bit more frequently, uh, anywhere from one to three times a week to help naturally decrease the amount of yeast on their body. After you've lathered them up with let's say a tea tree based shampoo, you can use a rinse, a naturally antifungal astringing rinse to help knock down or decrease the amount of yeast growing on your pet. So you can pour this gallon of natural solution over them, rub it into their coat and skin, especially hitting up points that are yeasty, armpits, feet, groin, around the tail, and then you're going to towel dry without rinsing. That provides some long lasting, not only um, improvement with how your dogs feel, but it'll help reduce how quickly the yeast you're able to replicate. You can use those rinses as often as, 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 often as necessary. Um, Two things to note, lemon juice and hydrogen peroxide, if you're using it in your foot dunks, uh, can bleach out your black dog's fur. So if you have light colored dogs, nothing to worry about. If you have black dogs, you would pick vinegar over other solutions so you didn't have a lightening effect. One last comment I'd like you to think about when it comes to yeast. Oftentimes dogs become seasonally yeasty, which means when the, when the weather becomes hot and humid, dogs can become more stinky and more yeasty. That's your cue to start cleaning, disinfecting, and of course addressing diet. If your dogs have yeast issues year round, which means if you have pets that regardless if it's a dead of winter or 90 degrees outside and you have a yeasty pet, you've got to be thinking about potential immune system issues, which means if your pet is overwhelmed with an opportunistic pathogen, which is what yeast is, you need to be thinking about their immune systems not, be 100, not being 100% up to par. At my